Hello everyone, welcome back to the Craft of the Draft podcast, a massive grand final show, probably our favourite episode of the last two years really where we get to recap the season that was and also preview the two biggest games of the years. No question today, we're going to go straight into it, we're going to review the prelim finals, give our team of the years for the boys and the girls in the talent league, give out a few little awards that we came up with ourselves and then preview both the boys and the grand finals in a lot of depth. So we'll start with the prelim finals and let's be honest, it was a bit lackluster. I felt like apart from really the Rebels Oakley boys game, a lot of the prelims felt like they just worked themselves out yeah, the after three, a couple quarters. Yeah, three of the four across the boys yeah, and, and the, the girls, girls games. Yeah. So I guess we'll start with the boys doubleheader at RSCA Park on Sunday, Sandy taking on Dandenong in the first game there and it was tight for a quarter. Dandy really took it up to them with a big bodied midfield, started with Cooper Hines, Harvey Langford and Elwood Peckett in there, kicked the first couple of goals of the game but then from there it was one way traffic and there was wasn't too much to write home about from a Dandenong perspective. Dan- Sandringham just too classy and ended up outworking them as the game went on, it felt like. Yeah, I think it was 0 to 13 and then it was 75 to 13, or, or maybe not to that extent, or 75 22. So it was just a massive onslaught from that point onwards. There's a couple things I just want to bring up and discuss. Cooper Hines is the first one from a Dandenong perspective. And that I feel like that game was a good. I don't know, a summary of his season almost in terms of he'll come out of come out of the you know, come out of the, the race. He'll be explosive to start with, but then he'll die off at points. So he has those moments of dominance, but then we see less of him. And my question is where does he sit in this draft? What's his capabilities at the next level? Because he has aspects of a top twenty player when he turns yeah. it on but he doesn't do it for long enough is probably my criticism. Where do you see him sitting? Because it just feels like he puts together a full four-quarter game. He's one of the best in this draft. Yeah, I feel like you've been really harsh on him. I think he's contributed in every single game that he's played, and I think he's been one of the better performers. But I do appreciate that there has been some mixed opinions about him. And, yeah, I'd say he's in that 10 to 20 category as we sit at the moment. Uh, He finds a way to contribute. He doesn't need a whole lot of the footy. And I think the weekend was... Uh, probably one of his lesser performances, if you're to be completely honest, but he still found a way to contribute with a massive first quarter. But that's what's been so good about watching him is you know he's going to kick some goals or he's going to win some big clearances at some vital moments. So I'd put him in the 10 to 20 range. What does he do at the next level? Are there question marks still over his conditioning perhaps? But I'd still say that, you know, a couple of pre-seasons under his belt and he's going to be fit as a fiddle and his size is a really attractive prospect for AFL clubs. Yeah, I agree. Maybe I'm being a bit too harsh. If you had to give him a give him a range right now, yeah, ten uh, to twenty, ten to twenty. Oh, I'd still sit in between twenty to forty, but I do think he projects better than that yep. at the next level. Next talking point is on the St Kilda NGA boys, and we saw three of them on the weekend in Adrian Cole, Lenny Hoffman, and Alwood Peckett. And I think the conversation is is interesting there in terms of what the Saints are going to do come draft time. They yep. obviously have the commitment to take one zebras player but yep. obviously all those three played for the Zebras so they can pass off as that rather than a, a senior listed VFL player who do you like the most out of those three at the moment who's showing the most promise i you know I don't have the, the amount of picks locked in my head for each club but I'm assuming they will have enough to get all of these players but when yeah. the bids come in yeah. who's going to be taken first yeah they'll get crafty to make sure they can match the bid if that's something they want to do and it will be interesting to see what they do from a VFL perspective because yeah like you said that's been rumoured yeah. that they'll take one of these boys and pass it off as that Zebras listed player because none of the Zebras listed players have necessarily shown yeah. AFL attributes yeah. for a prolonged period from my point of view I think you need to take one of the two defenders. I think that fits their list needs a little bit better than Alwood Peckett, who to me has a little bit too much sameness to what they already have on their list. And out of the two defenders, if you were just to take one, I'd take Lenny Hoffman. I think he becomes the better player, obviously a little bit rawer as things sit. But if you're taking Adrian Cole, you have to understand that he has got the athleticism and he has got the tools, but he's probably going to need a little bit more coaching when it comes to his skill set. So I'd lean towards Lenny Hoffman at this stage. Yeah, it's interesting. I agree with that statement, but I also reckon that Adrian Cole better fits their system in the near future rather than Lenny Hoffman, who probably needs a couple more years to develop and 
uh, get himself into an AFL environment a bit more, whereas Adrian Cole has the build, quite a good build already. So that's, uh, I, I think both will eventually find their way. But yeah, it's, it's interesting it's in those two point of views. Certainly an interesting talking point. I think the other one to come out of that game is Riak Andrew keeping Harry Armstrong to just the one goal after keeping Job Shanahan goalless a couple of weeks ago. So a really good final series from Riak Andrew, who also intercepted well against Gippsland in the semi in the quarter final rather. So yeah, a, a good finish to the season for the 19 year old from Dandenong. But we'll move on to the Oakley GWV game. The way I saw that game was Oakley kicked themselves out of it, and across their last two finals, they've kicked. 17 goals, 34, and that doesn't account for complete misses. So, you know, bad kicking's bad football, as people say, and honestly, Oakley should probably have put that game away by half time or not too long thereafter because they looked really potent and they looked like they were going to score against the wind in the second quarter. They just couldn't put it on their scoreboard. The midfielders were on top for prolonged periods, but they just didn't capitalise. Yeah, it was. it, was, oh, it felt like what we talked about in the preview that, if you shut down Ollie Hannaford, where are the goals going to come from from yep. the Rebels? And, and Blake Lidler did that. Blake Lidler did that, which is one of our, our talking points that comes up naturally. But, yeah, I said to you, Oakley have come out and prepared and GWV have no plan B. And it did feel like that. GWV won off Oakley's inconsistency and having a good wind. Apologies in the background if you hear that noise. There's um, the grass cutters in the background as there's a local footy oval um, outside our window. But... Yeah, I am surprised that the Rebels did what they did in the end. They, they, you know, they held up with all that pressure that was coming towards them and they capitalised and that's all they needed to do. Yep. I still have the same questions about the Rebels heading into this grand final, which we'll preview, but good to talk about Blake Lyder in this sense and he did a massive role on Holy Hannaford. He kept him quiet until really the midway of the third quarter where he kicked that goal. And then after the that, he kept him really quiet when quarter. GWV were coming yep. hard in the last quarter. He won some crucial one-on-ones. So it was quite interesting looking at the stats last night. Blake Leadlow finished with just the four disposals. Yeah, you would have. Seems like nothing. Yeah, which you, yeah, you'd say he was one of the most yeah. influential players on the ground with the way he wore. Ollie Hannaford, like a glove, but I think Jonty Fall had a really important game, kicking the five goals and marking really well. He didn't lose too many one on ones all day, so he had one of his better games in recent times. One he needed to have, another one who had a game that he needed to have was probably Floyd Burmeister. So he's put together a couple of good performances recently as well. Probably doesn't come up on the stats sheet, but he was a really commanding presence around the ground, as was Harley Hicks continuing on his strong quarterfinal form. Yeah, Floyd Burmeister is one who has... I feel like he's grown into his game a lot more as the season's gone on. I've, I've kind of questioned... He goes at a lot of the ball, but it can come across a bit... I don't know what the word is, but just a bit too much sometimes. He'll go for marks, flying for things that he's probably not going to get to. He's showing the commitment, but he was never really getting grasp of it. But I feel like it's coming together now and putting together some really good football. And Harley Hicks is one I'm excited to see. Yeah, you know, how he progresses, what his X factor becomes at the next level. We'll move now to the girls, which was played in absolute terrible weather on the Saturday. Hail, rain, shine, you know, Melbourne weather in Craigie Burn. John, you caught these two games yep. and it was as expected really. But Dandenong put up a good fight. Oakley just too good and Easton were just too strong for Geelong. I guess tell me about the conditions in general and those players who stood up because it, as much as it wasn't a good day for football, it's a good day for recruiters at the very least. Yeah, it allows them to see who can stand up under adversity when the conditions are really against you. So I guess a quick summary on each game. I think Dandenong and Oakley really went toe-to-toe for the entire game. Oakley just had a 10-minute period in the second quarter where they were able to put three goals on the board and that proved the difference between the two teams where Dandenong weren't able to consistently put their ascendancy on the scoreboard and we knew that was going to be an issue coming into the games having watched them a few times in the last couple of years and then Easton kicked four goals in the first six minutes against Geelong and from there it felt like the game was over so that was sort of the tale of the tape in terms of the players that stood up Sarah Pouse did lay the 17 tackles had the 18 disposals she was huge in close for the Oakley charges and really it it capped off a really strong season she's obviously got a game to go but really really impressive to see. Gemma Reynolds was quite clean, had some important moments when Dandenong were able to get on top. Grace Balloning's class really came to the fore and Briley Anderson's hardness is one that we should 
watch in the next couple of years because I thought she played the best game that I've seen her play. Also want to give a shout out to Scout Semple who rose to the occasion. Two goals in the first three minutes for Easton. She really seized those moments, finished with just the six or seven touches, but it was a prototypical small forwards performance. How would you assess Dandenong's year just as a, as a quick follow-up in terms of they're, they're, they're always the hard done by a team, it feels, feels like, like, because it, yeah. they're always that third best, really. They they just can't beat those two teams above them. But would you assess that season as, as, a, as a win for them? It's so hard because the, the games they did get against against Oakley and Easton, who were the two teams above them, were in shocking conditions. Yeah, they had they yeah. had the one game against Oakley right at the start of the year, but that's round one and you can kind of forgive blowing out the cobwebs. Yeah. But, yeah, it's very hard because you would love to have seen the Gemma Reynolds and Kayla Dalgleish type players going yeah. against them in dry weather. It might have been a different result. They might have been able to put it on the scoreboard with the way that they play, having a little bit more flair and X factor on the outside. So I would say it's a pass mark. But, yeah, heartbreaking for Dandenong. They're always there. They just can't take the next step. Moved now to our exit meetings, which we've done the last couple of weeks when teams exit the Coates Talent League. John, to you lead this as always, but we'll start with the boys, which were Oakley and Dandenong. Yeah, we'll start with Oakley. So Blake Leadler first. I say injury prevented consistency for him, but his speed and ball use as well as lockdown abilities were all promising. Draftable aspects, I just don't think it's the complete package to get him drafted, though. Yep, yep, that's a fair call. Pat Reshko's work rate was unquestionable, but his inefficiency limited his productivity. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I still see a lot of upside for him at the next level, though. Tom Gross, his X Factor and toughness in spades, but I think uh, I think few were better than him at his best, particularly with what he was able to perform to produce at Coates and Champs level. I think his season changed dram- dramatically at the back end of champs. He's yep. fixed up those deficiencies and he's become much... Yeah, he's, he's stapled himself as a top 20. Yeah, yeah. Well well summed up. Uh, Fino Sullivan, three words. Injury creates intrigue. Yeah, bloke, he could have... He could have sewed up pick one, let's be honest. But if, yeah, he's, he's got too much doubt on him now. He's still got the quality. But yeah, injury. Um, Jagger Smith hasn't put a foot wrong. The only question marks remain something outside of his control being his size. A hey, Morish medalist. Yeah. Question mark. Well, yep. well, we'll find out. Well, if you listen to this on Wednesday night, you'll probably have, if you go to Talent League app, it's probably there already. But uh, Certainly. Yep. Noah Uze's versatility and strength has kept his name thereabouts. Yeah, that, that competitiveness as well. I think it, you know, it's always going to spark conversation in the father-son talk. Definitely. Uh, Zane Cochran was really well regarded in preseason internally and showed why without probably cementing a clear point of difference. I'd agree, but he's, he was always there and lifted during that private school period for Oakley. Uh, Doug Kerr got injured just at the wrong time with that ACL, but his form was solid outside of that without absolutely absolutely nailing his draft ability. Yep, great. Uh, and Luke Quayner, strong and versatile, but whether it translates to the next level remains questionable. I only ask a quick question. Do you reckon Colin would take him? Uh, I'd lean more towards a no at this point. Interesting. Maybe he'll have some development through VFL, and but he's he does have those aspects. You have to yeah. You can't not notice him. But yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then from a Dandenong perspective, a great year for them in terms of developing their, their second layer of talent, I suppose, below the big couple of players in Cooper Hines and, and Harvey Langford. Alwood Peckett showcased his versatility and strength after an excellent preseason, but remains a little bit polarizing. Agree, but a good back end to, to help his case. Yeah, definitely. Charlie Orchard, athletic and composed and continually improving in his first year in the Coates League system. Yeah, I love what he brought, uh, especially in the back end of the year. He's, he's got a bit of reliability about him. Riak Andrews long established his athleticism, but his final series showed a different element to his game. I can't fully agree. I still think that element of one-on-one defense is is just a question mark. He's had that extra year as well. He's not yep. 18, which it works against him, but he He's got a chance, though, I have to admit. Very lightly framed, though. Harvey Langford was ultra consistent with a spike at the right time of the year, being the champs. Oh, 100%. He's he's helped his case, you know. Um, Cooper Hines, a strong preseason, laid the platform for a brilliant CTL season. You know what his strengths are, and 
he put them on show. He did exactly what he needed to do and was good at it every time. Certainly. Sam Toner proved to himself as much to anyone else how good he could be. Continue building, please. Yeah, I wish I saw more of him. Only got to see him once and then he had that injury at the back end, but yeah. And Jordan Doherty took his overage opportunity with both hands as the most elusive ruck in the comp, but whether he's too small to do that role at the next level is a big question mark. It is, but I love his mobility. You can't. It, it's so yep. rare to find a player that can do that at that at that height in general. And then last one, Noel Moraz dealt with the injury setback with a great, which showed his excellent personality and attitude. Yeah, it's hard to rank him now actually because we've seen yep. very little of him. Move now to the girls with Dandenong and Geelong. Yeah, so we'll start with. Haley Peck, a dominant season without probably showing the AFLW attributes to set her apart. Yeah, I thought there were glimpses at times, and I still think there were, just the consistency is my question mark. Rebecca Cloddy, athletic and tenacious, but her kicking needs ironing out. Yeah, it's just those general ball skills I got the question mark on, but that aggressiveness and, and will to get the footy is, is second to none. Mika Morrissey maintained her status as the best specialist winger. Yeah, running patterns are, are, are quite elite for, for the level she's at now. So exciting at the next level. Hopefully she gets the opportunity. Sasha White showed enough dynamism to put her right in the mix. Yeah, I, I think she's, when we get to the AFLW draft chat in a couple of weeks, she's definitely one that's gone under the radar. Yeah, definitely. Um, Sarah Howley was a picture of consistency. She continued rather than built on her bottom-aged form. Yeah, it was it was. Same, same from Sarah Howley, that being very good. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, Gemma Reynolds and Kayla Dalgleish, I'm sort of putting them together. They were a one two punch in the midfield and forward line for Dandy Nong, and each showed their point of difference quite extensively. Yeah, you lose those players, you lose a lot of depth in that side. So, really, really consistent and productive. Zoe Basenko, I feel like, just scratched the surface of her ability. I'd have to agree. I was always. She's got draftable traits. I yep. wonder if she's um, in the same kind of boat at the moment as uh, the names left to me. The Dandenong girl who didn't get drafted last year, but she got picked up. Gemma Ramsdale. Gemma Ramsdale, yeah. I don't know if she sits in similar areas to that, but I still think she's probably got a yeah. good chance. She's Obviously good different types of players, but yeah, I'll take your point. And then Ali Simons, she raced back from injury quicker than anyone expected her to and put together powerful form. Actually, I can't believe we didn't talk about this before. Is her as a mid is yeah. a scary thought. That when I saw, turned on and saw that, you think for a player of that size to have such dominance yeah. was unbelievable. She's, she's yeah, played not a lot of footy, but done as much as some have in a whole year. She's that good in that in that sense. She was, she was awesome. But that's our exit meetings done. We are now going to get into our awards part of the podcast. The exciting time. We've got two team of the year. So one for the boys. One for the girls, and, and these graphics will be available on Instagram to see see the full teams out. But we're going to go through line by line. We're not really going to give our explanations as to why, just to keep the podcast moving. But we'll start with the boys. Yep. John T, if you're getting it up, I yep. can. You go I'll, first. I'll keep reading. Well, I'll, maybe I'll read out the boys. You read out the girls. Yep, sounds good. Start with the full back line. Luca Grego from the Western Jets, Matt Whitlock from the Murray Bush Rangers and Charlie Orchard from the Dandy on Stinrays on the half back line. Toby Travaglia from Bendigo, Alex Taru from Gippsland and Lockie Jakes from Geelong. So that's our defensive stock. In the middle, we've got on, the, on one win, we've got Lucas McInerney from the Northern Knights, Jagger Smith from the Oakley Chargers and Christian Moraes on the other wing from the Eastern Rangers. On the half forward line, we've got Joe Berry from the Murray Bush Rangers, Joe Shanahan from Bendigo and Josh Murphy from Murray as well. Full forward, Cooper Hines from Dandenong, Jonty Fall from GWV and Ollie Hannaford as well in the other forward pocket from GWV. Our followers, Jordan Doherty gets that ruck position. Levi Ashcroft from Sandy and Josh Smiley as well. On the bench, we have Harvey Laneford from Dandenong, James Barrett from Bendigo, Bailey McKenzie, who kicks six as well on the weekend for Sandringham, Lenny Douglas from Tassie and Xavier Lindsay from Gippsland. So congratulations for making it into our team of the year. And on the girls' side of things, the full back line, Holly Egan from Murray, who has moved down there midway through the season, Asher Fern Warren and the bottom major from Eastern Rangers and Alex McBride Loan from the Western Jets. Half back line, Bella Davies from GWV, Sienna Hobbs from Bendigo had a great season and Alice Stoddart from Gippy. On the wings, 
were Evie Parker, the speedy Eastern Rangers captain, and Sierra Greaves. And in the midfield was Sarah Pousty from the Oakley Chargers. Half forward line, Chloe Bound from Oakley. Grace Balleny, the bolter from Eastern Rangers. And Ash Centra from Gippy. Full forward line, you had Ava Reid, the goal sneak from Tassie. Emma McDonald from Oakley. And Georgia Knight from the Eastern Rangers. And then your followers, Josie Bamford, the bottom-aged Eastern Rangers. Ruck gets that primary ruck position with Luke Painter and Sarah Howley at her feet from Bendigo and Geelong respectively. On the interchange bench, we had Holly Ridewood and Zoe Hargreaves, both from the Northern Knights. Gemma Reynolds from the Dandenong Stingrays, Taylor McMillan from the Eastern Rangers, and Priya Bowering, what a season she put together from the Apple Isle. Well, now we've got some some awards of just a few categories that I came up with, and I said to John, do you pick one, one boys, one girls, and we'll go through and See what we come up with. I don't know how much we'll double up. There's yep. only one we know we've doubled up with, but first one is the best moment of the season. Now, I'll, we'll go boys and then girls. My best boys moment was Hannaford 6 against John. Only yep. a couple of weeks back. I don't think yep. I've ever been that excited in the stands to watch a player genuinely turn it on. Yeah. But my other option is right at the start of the year, I love that Bendigo v. Murray game, the three-point game. That, yep. was, that was exciting to watch. Yours? Uh, Xavier Lindsay's game against Vic Country did it on the yep. biggest stage and what a performance it was under great pressure on the in the inside and outside. We only had one response on Instagram, which was from Job Shanahan. And of course, he was going to say this, but Ollie pull after the siren against the Rebels. Yeah, this one didn't get a lot of traction, this one. There, there were a lot of others that got lots of traction, but not this moment. And then the best girls moment, Claire Marnie kicked 2-2 to start the season. It it was a great performance yeah. that laid a foundation which led to her national combine invite. She took seven marks as well. Mine was Centra's 47 right yep. at the start of the year. Yep. Was, I'm surprised we have both at the start of the year. Our next one is most courageous. We both agreed on, on these two, but it was Alex Taru and Sarah Pousty. I feel like yep. there's a lot of daylight between these yeah. two. Yeah. And the second best for boys and girls, do you agree? Yeah, I would. Next one, uh, best 17-year-olds. Um, Alex McBride, lone best 17-year-old girl I've gone with. And then Archie Ludewick, the best 17-year-old boy. I've gone... I, I'm pure. I mean, they, these responses are based off their full season. I reckon yeah. Lockie Doverson was the best 17-year-old. In terms of productivity and consistency, he was always there. We'll talk about this more in a couple of weeks, but and unbelievable then, then that... I had, he didn't get yeah, the 17. He's not true. playing on AFL Grand Final Day. And Priya Bowring as well. Best 16-year-old, my boy was Cody Walker. My boy was Tate Hodgson. Flew under the yeah. radar but did very well at the Northern Knights. Got a few games in the back end of the season. Uh, I've got two girls. I think I had to mention both. Bailey Martin from the Chargers and, and Sophia Green from Murray. I, I had um, Magella Day from yeah. the Murray Bush Rangers. Awesome. Unsung hero. So... This one was this one. We had a discussion. This is this is hard. My unsung hero, and this is more of me feeling guilt that I didn't watch him enough. Was James Barrett? Yeah. Maybe he's not as unsung as. See, to you, that's a stupid answer, right? But to me, I don't think I gave him the credit he did. Without him in that Bendigo side during a pretty tough season, they yep. probably lose by a lot more on more occasion. Who was your boy? Uh, Pat said. Yeah, that's a good one. He that's a good, good one. He was always point yeah. of the year for quarter. My girl is Stacia Stevenson. Yes. Okay, yeah, yep. um, that, yeah, she's one that I think again in a couple of weeks' time has to be discussed. She doesn't get the accolade she deserves purely because she's in a team that is stacked. It's the second best team in the competition and could be the best team in the competition come the weekend. But and all the best to her as she recovers. She hobbled off after a brilliant first quarter with an ankle injury. It looks like. Well, hopefully she is. But is she did, did that look bad enough? Yeah, not, I don't think she'll be playing on the weekend. That's not great at all. Not good news to hear. Best personality to watch. So this is like the personality, not just the person. Yeah. I have Isaac Kako for boys. I and think. I've gone I've gone probably a little bit left centre. I've gone Charlie Rowe. He, I love the way he sticks yeah. up for his teammates and he's always in the thick of it if there's any sort of uh, fight on field. I've, I'm, I've stuck small forwards. Georgia Knight for Eastern is... Yep, is, yep same. Uh, you, you, the small forwards I always give you the best on the field. Okay, so these last two is most improved and most rapid bolter. Now, the difference is the most improved is not someone who's necessarily gone from pick 60 to pick 20. It is someone who might have gone from pick 40 to pick 35, but they've had a range of improvement and in, as a result have not gone down the ranks. They have just built up. Whereas most rapid is someone who has gone from pick 40 to pick 20. So who's your most improved boy? My most improved boy is James Barrett after an yep. injury interrupted bottom age campaign. Mine's Joe Berry. I think yeah. it could also be in, in both, to be honest, but I do think 
in terms of his improvement, he's just kept getting better. And then my girl is Zari Byrne, who's come from nowhere yep. and had a great season for Gippy as the ruck. I've gone Avi Parker. I think yep. she's. I, I wasn't catching her as much as in the start of the year, but I slowly thought that saw that improvement build. Who's your most rapid bolter for the boys? I'm pretty sure this would be Alex the same. Taru. Same. Who's your girls? Uh, Grace Balleny. Got Lexi Gregor as a as a you know left field type of answer. I think she's. I guess playing for Bendigo when they're losing most weeks, it's hard to get a good gauge, but I think yep. she came into country and did herself the world of good. Now we move into our grand final preview previews for the boys and the girls. We're going to start with the boys first, but before we get into that, we spoke to both Luke Kennedy and Mitch Lloyd after their preliminary finals wins, asked them a few questions about their performances, and I guess they're, what they're predicting going into this week's grand final. So here's the clips of those two talking big performance from you and I guess tell me about the emotions going into this grand final the you know the team expectation and your performance as well this week and heading to next week what's that dynamic look like in, in such a massive game and do you keep the same things rolling yeah definitely I think we're all very excited yeah for a few of us it's our first granny I think Brody Finlay hasn't won one he's been in three but obviously he would love to to get one but yeah I think we'll just stick to to, to our guns play Dragons football and um, hopefully come out winners Tell us about your individual journey. Obviously, won the Ormond Best and Ferris last year. Missed the Sandy List. It's a it's a pretty sort of romantic storyline. What's what's that work rate looked like for you? And what have been the key focuses for you? Yeah, obviously, I just try try to get better in the preseason. I got two brothers that I I work hard with in the preseason, so just try and get fit over there and yeah, just just back myself throughout the preseason. I guess what's the biggest key aspect going into next week? You talk about Dragons footy, but what wins you the grand final and ultimately tops off another good season? I think it's just in the contest. Yeah, we get numbers around the football, we chain out with hands, and uh, that's how we break teams apart. So, yeah, all around the contest, and then we lengthen width and hopefully we get out the back. So, yeah, I think that's our method. How much focus do you individually put on the defensive running side of your game? Is that something you really pride yourself on? Because it certainly stands out on field watching. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I pride myself on my two-way. Um, but in a lot of weeks, I get like a run with kind of role. So obviously, I'm I defensive first and I pride myself on that. But if I want to get forward as well, um, I try and uh, hurt my teammates with that, with work rate. And the smoky for a big performance next week? Probably circuit, jack circuit. Here with GWV co-captain Mitch Lloyd. Mitch, the immediate emotions of making a Coach Talent League grand final? Yeah, it's unreal. Such a good feeling. Great all-round team effort. Um, we weren't in front for long, but we probably just made the most of our chances and uh, got up in the end when the final siren went. How do you approach such a postseason when you know the team's not really together through the like most of the year, and then you come together and every all the pieces start to you know come back? But what's it been like this last couple of weeks, and how do you gel together, especially being in different parts of the state? Yeah, it's unreal. We just have that never surrender sort of mentality. Like, we love being the underdogs. We just get up at the right time. We'll play for each other. And, yeah, that's, that's about it. What was Coach David Loder's message at three-quarter time? How were you able to produce that last quarter with the wind to take you home? Uh, it was just sort of the play to our strengths and um, look up, look for the big men and play tactic- tactically, yeah, pretty much. Just, yeah, to Coming up against Sandy, I guess, what's the approach? You've never played them this year, so it's almost just a, I mean, first time in a grand final. How do you approach that type of game with the talent they have as well? Is it very like for like, or do you go in just with a team approach that you hope can beat them? I feel like we go with a similar approach to what we did today. We sort of just focused on us and it was us against them, us against ourselves pretty much. So we just wanted to work for each other and, um, yeah, just play out to us and not really worry about them. If we're at our best, we have that belief that we can uh, be better than anyone else in the comp. You've played undersized on a fair few opponents this year. You could have Harry Armstrong in the grand final and without wanting to give away any, I guess, state secrets or anything like that, how does the possibility of that or Bailey McKenzie or Archie Ludewick sort of sound to you? Oh, yeah, it's definitely a good challenge and, yeah, I feel like I'm up for it. I've been waiting for something like this. As a defender, you always love playing on the uh, on the star players and hopefully if you chop them down, you can turn some heads. So that's all right. And if I just play my role and um, play good on whoever I get, whoever it is, um, yeah, that, that we'll hopefully can get up. Ta- tell us about a few other players who have really shone in the last few weeks or so as you've started to really find your form. 
Well, obviously, yeah, John T. Four kicked five today. He's a bloody star. Yeah. Hopefully, um, gets him up there and a bit of a bolter in the draft. He's always been up there, but hopefully that can. And also, Ollie Hannaford, he's had a great couple of a month or two. He's been kicking goals left, right, and centre. So hopefully, yeah, and those two ones have been on fire recently. And then last question for you, who's the smoky in the team to have a really big grand final performance? Um, Archie Caldo, big tall midfielder in and under, loves it. He's, he's sort of the barometer of the team. He's always up and about. We, when he's on, we're, we're going well. And, yeah, he's just good culture, man. And we're back. So we're going to get right into the boys' grand final first, which is the Sandy Dragons against the GWV Rebels. I think what we need to say first is for the Rebels to make a first grand final in 27 years, yep. that's very impressive. It's always a testament to the region as well that these boys don't even train with each other all the time. You've got guys in the southwest, Horsham, in Ballarat. So yep. they're not in the same spot and it's an extremely impressive feat. I was looking through the last couple of grand finals. I mean, it's always Metro teams. Like if you yeah, take or Dandenong. Out, who but we, if who you take out together. Dandenong, it's yeah. been like Murray... You know, a couple of years back, Geelong were probably the most recent when they got, won those back-to-back, um, The sorry, the two grand finals in a row. So, a testament to the Rebels and the same goes for the Dragons. That's three in a row, which is unbelievable to think. If they do it. If they do it. I mean, we were there for their first one in 2022. Last year, they beat the Rangers. Where do you want to start? I we'll think my, 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 biggest, my biggest, again, like I we'll said... We'll start with the midfield, I reckon. Yeah, that's not even my biggest concern, but we'll, yeah, okay, let's start with the mid. Where's, I, where's it won or lost? Yeah, well, I think GWV are going to want to make it a country dogfight in the midfield. Yeah. That's the way they're going to win this game of footy because they've got a lot of role players like Archie Caldo who can really, really take it up to Sandy physically. We saw Dandenong try to do that. They were able to do it for a quarter, but then they were just beaten on the spread, and that's a real concern for GWV. I think Jack O needs to continue his strong form, win the contested footy, be really clean. And I think Flynn Penry and Floyd Burmeister have an enormous role because I think the one area on the ground where they have the advantage on paper, GWV, is in the ruck. Yeah, Flynn Penry yep. will be up against Brody Finlay. You'd back Flynn Penry, and Floyd Burmeister will be up against Lockie Voss, who hasn't played a lot of ruck this year as the second ruck. He's generally been as a key back, but he's changed roles in the final series, so they need to really exploit that because if Sandy get on top in the ruck, then I think Lee Ashcroft, Murphy Reid, they're just going to run him off the feet like they did to Dandenong. I'd like to see Flynn Penry get involved a lot around stoppage because he's yep. quite good below his knees. I just I think that can work to quite an advantage for the Rebels. And as I repeated last week, Sandy don't defend. The midfielders don't defend. That's just the, that's their style. They're a very offensive team, a lot of their mids. And we saw that quite early with Dandenon as well. That's, yep. that's how they scored both their first goals. It's over the back. You kill them in transition. Yep. What was interesting, sorry, was that the game seemed to turn when Luke Kennedy went into the midfield, a two-way but, runner. But even in that, though, he was still really offensive. It was almost a different type of Luke Kennedy. Yep. So. You know you've got a player like that. The only thing, I say that, but the Rebels don't have that style. They're not really an out-the-back team. So how do they combat, you know, Sandy's offensive style? Can you find a way to counteract that and and hurt them in that area? Uh, I guess for Sandy, who's that one player who they have a good day and you're doomed? And that's the thing with Sandy. Yeah. Only one has to have a good day. I mean, day, you could say anyone. You could doomed. say Levi Ashcroft. You could say Murphy Red. You could say yeah. Sam Marshall. You could say Nathaniel Sulzberger. And you could say Luke Kennedy. We saw what Cooper Lord did on grand final yeah. day last year. No one was expecting it, but he'd be talked about a lot more if he was in a different team. So there's five. Whereas right. for yeah. GWV, you think Jack O's got a big role to play, but that's why their team chemistry is so important. And it's been so impressive in recent weeks, given they haven't played together very much because of injury. Yeah. And like you say, they don't train together. So that's sort of the midfield battle, I think. I'm sure they'll... Oh, I'm making assumptions. I'm sure they'll come together this week, the Rebels, and, and do you know a full training session yeah. as much as they possibly can. I asked a question of Ollie Hannaford. Do you move him into the middle in this type of game? You talked about making it a scrap fight. Well, he's that type of play you need in there. Sandy's mids are smaller. You've got Levi Ashcroft is 179. Yeah. Murphy Reid is, you know, same, same, same. So, Oli Hannaford going in there isn't really reducing height by any means. Is he someone you'd consider? Uh, it's not a bad call. I do think they need him up forward because they yeah. need the scoreboard potency that he offers. We'll move to the GWV forward line, I suppose, now yeah. and, and the Sandy back line. And I think... 
yeah, Oli Hannaford has a huge role. I think he's going to get the matchup on Mitch Kirkwood Scott. I think you called this as yeah, soon as the yeah. two games are over. It'd be great to see him go at each other. They're both tenacious and they, yeah. they both love a fight. But if I'm GWV, what I'm doing is I'm recalling Charlie McKinnon. I thought he was a real surprise omission for yeah. the preliminary final. I know he's had a quite a few weeks, but I think what you need to do cause if you're going to win this game is you need to hope that everyone comes to play, and that includes Charlie McKinnon, who at his best is in their best 23. The reason I'm recalling him is because the way GWV win this, I think, is marks inside 50. You've got yep. Floyd Burmeister, who is going to stretch Sandy for height. He probably gets the matchup on a on an Owen Bader because you're going to have Jonty Fall is going to be on Adrian Cole. Yep. And then Charlie McKinnon, if he plays, is then going to have to take Lenny Hoffman, who they like being as that third man across. It really stretches the Sandy defense if you've got three marking forwards, particularly in the absence of Luke Trainer. So I'd be bringing him back because do they have the potency at ground level if Oli if it gets shut down, I think the weekend shows that there's a little bit of a gap there, despite Harley Hicks playing a really strong game. Yeah, I mean, there is a massive gap. That's And Oakley stopped that. And that's been like, I, I looked back at the score. If I think if Oakley kicked a goal, Charlie Richardson had a shot in the third quarter, they would have been up 59 to 30. Like, and that yep. was midway through the third quarter. JWV were really struggling for points on the board. And I don't know. Is the weather meant to be good? Have you had a look at the weather forecast? I think it was 17 yeah, from memory. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Maybe a bit of rain. Uh, the The point is I, I do agree with that sentiment that Rebels do need a bit more potency inside the forward 50. Ollie Hannaford will be shut down. that because, And he's almost had done himself dirty by playing so well. They're just going to go straight to him and say, no, nah, you're not doing anything today. I mean, Mitch Kirkwood Scott has to do that, firstly. Yep. But it could be Harry Oliver, to be honest, as well. But I think be. it would be Kirkwood Scott. That's why I think Ollie Hannaford would be better suited in the midfield because yep. he will have an impact. You, Sandy are likely going to put a defender on him, assuming he's going to be playing in that forward line. You put him into the midfield, well, then it spices up things. You bring in a Charlie McKinnon, then what? Who are they looking for? What are the forward and defensive matchups like? So it's, yeah. it's interesting. I guess I, the, the just to close on that, if he doesn't have an impact offensively in the midfield, you know he's going to be able to shut someone down and, and yeah. his pressure is going to be really good. So I, I don't mind the call of putting him in the midfield. Maybe it's something that yeah, you see 10, 15 minutes into the game. Yeah. If he's struggling, then yeah, get him involved because he's one of your better players. You need him involved in the game if you're going to win the game. Well, when he runs out games well, so I don't, yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. It depends on the flow of this game. If it's getting, if it gets to a point in the third quarter where it's three or four goals, you probably have to make that switch a bit yep. earlier than, you know, a bit later. If it's closer, uh, what's the last one we haven't done? Sandy's forward line and the Rebels. This is the structure. biggest area of concern yeah. for the Rebels for me. So Sandy have got three marking forwards in their forward line who all played Vic Metro in Archie Ludewick. Bailey McKenzie and Harry Armstrong. Yep. And I don't think that GWV have the cattle or the height to stop them on paper. So I'd say you'd have Mitch Lloyd would go to Harry Armstrong. And I think he's, he has been shut down a couple of times in recent weeks in matchups you'd expect him to win against Riak Andrew and against Liam Callahan, So I think Mitch Lloyd's got a really good opportunity to shut him down. I'd be playing Will Rantall on Archie Ludewick. The reason I'd be doing yep. that is he has had a, a quietly good couple of weeks, good strong one-on-one, -on -one, and give him the opportunity to do so. He's had an injury-interrupted year, and he really needs to show that he can shut someone down. If he can do it with his strength against Archie Ludewick, prevent him from getting to the positions he wants to, then that will go a long way. And then I'd be telling Ben McGlade that he needs to play a really strong game defensively on Bailey McKenzie because Bailey McKenzie, if you just focus on the other two, showed on the weekend that he can just get off the chain and kick six goals so don't give him any space on the lead Ben McLeod if I take a step back and go back to the midfield I think that's your biggest threat more than Sandy's forwards how do you stop their midfielders from kicking goals that's yeah. the one thing GWV I think lack as well at times their mids don't really go forward and, and hit the scoreboard you're usually good for a goal a game from someone like a Jack O and obviously if Sam Lawler's in that team you're going to yep. get some productivity out of him as well but from a Sandy perspective, Levi Ashcroft's kicking at least two on the weekend. You yep. could put that down as a certainty almost. Murphy Reed's dangerous for a goal or two. Even Harrison Oliver on the weekend kicked a goal. So how do you shut them down? I, I yep. think it's what's that balance? How, how much attention do you put into restricting their midfielders' offensive threat or do you shut down the forward line and their, yep. their, you know, their aerial capability? Well, that's the question actually to you. What do you put more effort into? I, I think... 
Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good question. I think I think the aerial battle is a big one, but I think it's the two way running of the midfield needs to really clog up that forward line for Sandy and not allow the tools to get those easy leading lanes. But also it prevents it gives frontal pressure to the midfielders trying to come in and kick goals. That's the way I'd read it. Before we go to our tips and big calls, Reese Unwin is one I think has a massive role to play in this yeah. game. He's we saw against. Um, Oakley, the first game against Oakley a few weeks back, he can hit the scoreboard. It was 0-5 yep. that day, but he's one as well. You talk about Harley Hicks, you can bring in Charlie McKinnon, but I think Reese Unwin's one that yep. if he hits the scoreboard. That's a massive contribution, and he's obviously had a, a poorer season that he'd wanted from a scoreboard impact point of view, but all he yep. has to have is, is one good day, really. We'll move now to our big calls. I haven't actually thought of one, but if you've thought of one, you can say yours. I'll go through our Instagram answers first. So we asked this on our story. Reese Unwin, best on ground, three goals, and that would would win them a grand final, I I reckon. Hannaford, best on ground. Do you reckon that's a chance? Yep. Definitely is a chance. Dylan Alexander, Foss runs out for GWV. <laughs> could could that. go yeah. back to his roots. Yeah. Where that's where he should yeah. be playing it based off where he you know, where he's grown up. GWV by one, that would be a cracking granny and Flynn Penry best on ground. One that could change the game for them. Have you got a big call? I'll give two big calls. I reckon Floyd Burmeister plays a statement game that keeps GWV in it until the last five minutes. It's going to be a yep. cracking grand final. I reckon Mitch Lloyd shuts down Harry Armstrong, keeps him to a goal or less. Oh, a, I reckon Harley Hicks kicks three. Yep. I think he's one that Sandy won't really put that much attention in, into. Yep. I just think he's one that will fly under the radar. That's probably my best, my big call. Yep. What's your tip? An Instagram poll, 78% said Sandringham, and that's 610 votes to Rebels, 168 votes, 22%. I am going to say Sandy by nine points. Look, I... My real honest answer, the Rebels shouldn't have got past Oakley and that was because the Oakley kicked themselves prepared. out of it. Yep. I think it'll be close until about three-quarter time. Uh, Sandy just – and they're big-time players. We saw that last year. I mean, Easton were as good as them, but yep. it was like 48 points at one stage. Like they just blew the game out of proportion. They just have that ability. I just don't think Rebels have that – Ability to blow the game out at any stage, whereas the Dragons, they put on three or four, that's your game. Yep. So I'll say Sandy by 23, but really excited. A great opportunity for the Rebels. It's 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 terrific that they've got back to the stage and I can you can put your money on it. The Rebels will have a better following there. The country yep. the country people will yep. come down and support them for this. We'll now move to the girls, Granny, Oakley and Easton. The repeat of last year. The yep. real question is can the Rangers do it? Yeah. They'd obviously got some revenge on the cards for last year. Before we even move in, I think they do. Yeah, well. Wow. I think there's an upset on the cards here. Oakley have the the better depth. Yeah. Eastern are in the better form, number one. They were up by 27 points against them a few weeks ago in the kind of wild card game. It didn't mean anything, but they still played in that wild card week. I think they have the better of them at the moment. But the question mark is now mentally after mm. that game, conceding up 27 points at three-quarter time and losing. Yeah. That, to me, says Oakley are down by 18 with 20 minutes left. We're going to win this and we're going to come back. So that, that's, I think, mentally now mentally, they have an yeah. edge. Yeah. Where do you want to start? I guess we we'll still start with the mid. Yeah, in this we'll one. start with the midfield. I think Oakley has a harder mid in tight at stoppage. They're the ones that you're going to back. They've got Sarah Pausty, Maggie Marnie, and Abby Vicino, who are all really good in tight. Easton have probably got a little bit more X factor and flair. And I think to bring that out, Josie Bamford is going to have to get on top in the ruck and you back her to do so. But I do think Oakley has the depth and the, the edge in the midfield battle. I, I think. Oakley's toughness as well will stand up at times. Yep. The bigger ground, I think, works towards Easton's favour, though. Yeah. Uh, they do both train out of small grounds, being Kilsyth and, and Warrawee, but yep. I think Easton have proved with their runners as well on the yep. outside. They can generate, generate it a lot quicker. Yeah. In terms of centre stoppages, you'd probably lean towards Oakley winning them a little more. So it's yep. what Easton can do with it, I guess, in open play around the ground. Can they make a lot? Can they get a lot of run going forward? Yeah. Um, I guess Oakley's forward line is where I have a lot of concern from an Eastern Rangers perspective yeah. because they've got Emma McDonald. So I think she'll likely have the matchup on Asha Fern Wannan, who's had a really strong season for the Eastern Rangers, the left footer. But it feels like Oakley has just so many more options in attack. They've got Emily Gladman who can kick goals, Bailey Martin who you touched on before, Chloe Bound, 
and well, Lucy well, Murphy. Bailey Martin was out on she the She was. She didn't play on the so weekend. So I just wonder. She, I don't know it what happened there. It was a late, there. late yeah. exclusion, though. So we'll, we'll see if she plays. But regardless, they've still got a lot of players who average more than a goal a game, whereas Eastern, it feels like, which we'll get to in a second, are relying on midfield goals, cameos, and Georgia Brisbane and Georgia Knight a little bit too much. So I think it's going to it's gonna be really incumbent on the midfield from Eastern to not allow them to get quick entries. Otherwise, those forwards have shown they can win their one-on-one ones and hit the scoreboard I, I do agree Oakley's forward line is a tough task to handle I do yeah. think you shut down Emma McDonald that's half the problem because yeah. I she does become a pretty direct source at times but they obviously know that's you need to work around her and the good thing about her is you know she doesn't take the mark she's bringing it to ground which is where yeah, those small become dangerous into it Emily Gladman is one as well she's your best ball comes to ground she's yeah. going to impact I think it's just understanding those matchups from an Eastern perspective. I mean, they clearly did it last time a couple of weeks yeah. ago. It's not like they're incapable of it. I think it's just understanding each forward's strength. They've yeah. they've got a lot of elements there, which is why it's so hard to stop. But yeah. if you match up the play as well, I think they've they're every chance to to stop them. And I'm looking back at this game. They Oakley only kicked. They were only at three goals by three quarter time. So they kept them. They kept them scoreless in the first quarter of this game. Yep. So three goals up to three quarter time. You take that result onto the weekend. That's a massive, massive yeah, result. Yeah, you take it. Yeah. And then I guess at the other end of the field, I think Evie Parker and I think Grace Balleny have a huge role forward of centre in the absence of Stacia Stevenson because those kicks yeah. need to be hitting their targets because you've got smart players who read the play well, Sienna Talleridi in particular, but also Charlotte Brewer who flies under the radar who will pick off the balls coming in or, or get themselves into really good positions if those balls don't have direction. So you need to make sure those kicks are hitting targets and going to really smart spots, getting it deep, getting it to dangerous territory. Yeah, I agree. I, I think territory will play a big part of this game as well. I think that's what we saw last year in this in this grand final on the bigger ground. The further it got in, the better chance. It was. It seemed like it was always played between that centre square and just on 50 and there yeah. could never be that final kick. Easton get that further. They've got a great chance there. I mean, the loss of Stacia Stevenson is massive. Like, yep. I think that's, in terms of run and productivity, you lose someone massive there. Georgie Brisbane has to kick two plus goals. Yeah, she I needs to have a real impact on the scoreboard. Do they lose it if she doesn't do that? I think so, yeah. I've got Oakley winning by 24. What's your tip? I, st- I do think Easton will win this. I, I don't know. I just think form plays a big part. I don't think Oakley's system has been clicking as much as it did in the start of the year, and and they re, they have got through on depth like yep. that. They, they're that good. That's yeah. And I guess that does play a part in my prediction here that they are also that good that they can just come back yep. at any stage. Easton by five, just to give a bit of perspective and a bit of a bit of difference in my tip. Big calls from Instagram. Vicino to win best on ground, that's a good call. Yep. I do like that call, actually, and she's a good shot. Zara Newworth keeps Georgie Brisbane quiet. That's a massive matchup. Yep. One, uh, you know, like we said, she's quiet. They probably don't win the game, Easton. A bottom major to win best on ground? Yep. Probably Taylor McMillan if it was a bottom major. Yeah, you think if so. If Easton win that grand yep. final. Grace Bellany to kick five. That's a massive statement. Has she actually kicked five this year at all? I'm not sure, but she's gone pretty close as a half Yeah. Tips was 71% Oakley, 409 votes to 29% Eastern, 168. So, geez, not many people back in the Rebels or Eastern in these grand finals, which would be hilarious if both of them get up in general. But that is all for today's episode. Massive grand final special. We will be back next week to review both these grand finals and also preview the under-17 grand final day showcase and, and go through some of our, our favorite players to keep an eye on it and what we're expecting from that game. So thank you all for watching. Make sure to tune into our socials for all grand final content during the rest of the week and on grand final day as well. And we'll see you in the next episode.